Uh, good afternoon. I want to thank everyone for participating today, uh, especially the participants here from the warehouse industry. It's uh, you've um, been asked because you you've been recommended uh, as experts in the field, and so uh, I look forward to hearing from uh, you today about your recommendations. And I appreciate the time and effort that you're uh, that you're putting into this uh, project. Uh, uh, our role is to listen to you, and we're going to try to keep it uh, relatively tight to a one-hour uh, time frame. Uh, we've uh, forwarded questions already to the participants today, and they've uh, considered them. Um, and uh, uh, these meetings are being recorded. Will be they'll be posted uh, on the FMC YouTube page and on the Maritime Transportation. Data Initiative web webpage, what, which we are in process of developing. Uh, for sake of ease, we're calling this MTDI, and, uh, in part because everybody in Washington has to have an acronym, and uh, in part because it's it's uh, faster. Um, uh, but uh, uh, we're we're uh, we want to keep this a, a public process um, so that people can um, present comments and recommendations uh, and. Uh, if one of the participants wants to uh, put anything up using a PowerPoint presentation, I don't know if anybody's uh, got anything, but please uh, post that, share that, so we can uh, keep it in the public venue. Um, uh, I want to point out uh, that this is a public meeting. Only participants will be able to speak. Uh, however, we'll post the meeting uh, on the MTDI webpage for public access. Uh, we we do welcome, uh, in fact, encourage public input uh, in into this process, and you can email us your feedback on data gaps, data needs uh, at uh, uh, maritime data at fmc.gov. Again, it's maritime data at fmc.gov. Uh, should you choose to uh, submit public feedback, uh, please reference whether it is in reference to an individual meeting or whether it's a general comment. Uh, also, we will be posting submitted materials and comments on our webpage, so be cognizant of the fact that these are uh, going to be available for the public. Uh, we cannot post PowerPoints uh, so that we ask material uh, be submitted uh, uh, to our um, email address in Word or PDF uh, format. Uh, please do not include any personal, personal identifiable information PII on any submissions to the FMC. We don't want to uh, uh, transmit uh, that information. Uh, we'll be doing these meetings uh, every Tuesday at 3 p.m., uh, uh, presumably weekly, but it could be biweekly depending on how we're doing. Um, and uh, it will lead up to a uh, FMC Maritime Transportation uh, Data Initiative Summit sometime in June, we hope. Um, and uh, uh, and we're here uh, really to get the views of, of those that are involved in the shipping, intermodal shipping uh, uh, industry uh, to get a, an idea if we can uh, come up with standards uh, that would be uh, capable of being used uh, interchangeably uh, on a nationwide basis. And also to get a sense of uh, where you in the industry are having uh, problem shipping to, to get a, a better sense of, of, of what sort of data is, is necessary for you to do your job more efficiently uh, in, uh, in moving cargo. Uh, we're having an incredibly uh, difficult uh, year uh, in large part because the volumes of, of trade are so uh, uh, strong. Uh, and, and in other parts, we've been uh, impacted by COVID and that's impacted operational issues uh, throughout the, the chains uh, of supply. And so um, uh, this is a critical effort. Uh, again, I appreciate your efforts. And so uh, today we're hearing from representatives from the warehouse distribution center, 3PL industry. And, uh, and uh, if we have time, we may ask some questions uh, after, after your uh, opportunity to speak, but we'll, we'll run through the uh, scheduled uh, participant uh, lists uh, first, and then uh, and and see where that gets us. Uh, uh, today, talking in order, we have Alexander Guzman, uh, customer customer service uh, manager, Interport Logistics, I believe from Miami, uh, 
uh, Brett Mears, president of uh, Palmer Logistics. Uh, and I think Brett is uh, from Houston, Texas, the uh, Houston, Texas area. Doug uh, uh, Sevilla, uh, president and CEO of uh, People Services Incorporated. Uh, and uh, Doug's from Canton, Ohio, uh, home of the uh, Hall of Fame. And uh, Jared Stadlin, uh, president of Linden Warehouses and Distribution Company. I think that's in New Jersey, up near the Port of New York. And Jeremy uh, Van Puffelen, a president of Prism Logistics uh, in Danville, California. Uh, and so uh, we'll lead off with Alexander. As I said before, if you could just uh, briefly describe a little bit about uh, your business and then get in uh, to the substance of your comments, that'd be appreciated. Sure. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, and thank you to everyone else and all the panelists uh, for the time here. Uh, yeah, so, my, like I said, my name is Alex. I'm from Interpol Logistics in Miami. Uh, we are a, uh, a supply chain logistics company. Uh, we have offices and warehousing in Miami and Los Angeles in the U.S., as well as other uh, offices in, internationally. Uh, we are a complete logistics and supply chain company. Everything under the supply chain or the logistics umbrella, we handle any uh, consulting, 3PL, warehousing, distribution, freight forwarding. Um, you know, you name anything under the supply chain, we will be able to handle uh, all with technology, of course, uh, uh, another solution that we provide all our customers. Uh, so thank you again uh, for having me on and looking forward to the conversation. Uh, Alexander, Alex, could you just go into the questions that we were asked and just uh, uh, answer those uh, to the, to, so we'll, we'll do you first and, and go all the way through, so. You want me to go through every question or just do uh, one? Yeah, one? yeah, I think so, unless you feel that uh, it's not uh, pertinent, go ahead and, and present what, what you present. We're looking forward to hearing your, your views. Sure, no problem. Uh, so I guess the first question is, uh, what are the key data elements that are integral to our operation? Uh, and I think everyone can attest to this. It's a lot of data that we all kind of manage and review and analyze. Uh, you know, mostly when it comes to warehousing and 3PL, we rely on a lot of that data coming from uh, our our customers, right? That that the house or inventory with us. Uh, when it pertains to you know maritime for F and C uh, data information, uh, I guess that I'll jump into the next question: where what data and and information uh, we will need, and I think that we will all benefit of uh, benefit from to become more efficient. So, and uh, we also control a lot of uh, the shipments coming from Asia, let's say, into the U.S. into our warehousing. And um, what what we did see, or what we would love to see, uh, in a proactive manner, you know, when we started coming through all these issues with the pandemic and the influx of volume coming in in the U.S. Uh, from Asia and other places, you know, it would have been, I think, beneficial at least to have a, a standardized database where you see all these containers that are set to arrive in all the different kind of ports that we all handle or are expert in, right? Because a lot of the challenges that we're facing is all the bottlenecks that are happening in the local ports, whether it be Miami, Los Angeles, LA, Houston, New York, New Jersey, right? Uh, I think we're all facing through these uh, challenges. So if we would have had uh, you know, simple way to extract data and say, oh, look, we have all of these containers coming in into the U.S. We can kind of adapt to that and make and kind of help us make decisions with our current business and our current customers to be able to kind of alleviate or try to add more resources or involve other parties uh, within the supply chain to assist us in those kind of uh, bottlenecks that we for lack of a better word, did not foresee coming, right? Because even though we all saw a significant impact increasing, but the actual data wasn't there available to most of us. Uh, we, we didn't see that coming in. Um, so, you know, some, some kind of data elements were related to that when it comes to maritime and FTC uh, involvement, right? Um, we'll, I think will benefit us all to help us kind of uh, maneuver or, or make decisions on a day-to-day -day basis here when we run our operations. Um, you know, uh, we, we house, we do a lot of uh, data analysis at Interport. I'm sure other companies do uh, a lot of data points that we, we handle. Um, one of the questions here is how do you get, uh, how do we get data from other parties and other supply chain um, 
partners as well, you know, we many ways, right? So now when it comes to bringing a customer on board, um, you know, whether they want warehouse fulfillment or uh, e-commerce fulfillment, you know, uh, we like to first see if we can integrate with them. So a, a lot of uh, our customers have the capability of integrating. There is, you know, many ways of integrating, whether it be API, a simple CSV file so we can upload into our system, um, integrate emails, integrate uh, system to system. There's, there's a array of different ways that we can integrate um, uh, to extract data and receive data to be able to handle and receive product in our warehousing for fulfillment. Um, so it, 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 all of those has helped us all become more efficient in when it comes to 3PL and warehouse, uh, because now we are a privy to that information in advance. So we can kind of, you know, let's say we have, I don't know, four, you know, four containers of volume coming in. We know that ahead of time, we kind of know the specs of the product that we're going to house, you know, dimensions, weight, you know, we kind of can prepare our warehousing to have that space available, uh, add the resources to that, to be able to, uh, handle the business that, that's coming in, you know. So, um, and the, the last question is how do we provide data to our customers? You know, um, we also have uh, KPI capabilities where many of our customers look at, uh, look to us to not only just straight warehouse fulfillment, but also uh, technology solutions. And a lot of that is through our KPI portals. And that's providing our, our customers with accurate data, uh, with lead times, with uh, inventory levels, um, you know, uh, turnaround levels, you know, it, it's, it's a lot of data that we like to present. And what we do usually is we sit down with the customers and we sit with them what they want to see, what are their interests, what are the KPIs that they want to be able to measure and present to them that on a monthly basis or give them access to the system so they can go in and make their own analysis. So um, there's, there's, you know, it's a lot of data, right? And as we go through the conversation, I guess we can elaborate a little bit more than as from I hear from our other panelists as well. Um, you can kind of get an idea of what I mean there, but it, it's a lot of data, but it's, we're, I think we're all pulling data from many different sources, whether it be from the customers, whether it be from the local port side or the terminal sites or from the carriers, from the, the local transportation companies. So, you know, I guess the biggest challenge we're all facing is trying to get all that data, putting it in one system and be able to adapt uh, based off of that, right? So, um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Alex, that was great. Uh, uh, Brett, uh, why don't you uh, take a stab at it? Uh, and uh, Brett, again, is from uh, the interior parts of, or no, Houston, excuse me. So, uh, vibrant uh, cargo uh, uh, center. So, uh, go ahead, Brett. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you so much, Commissioner Bensel. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity to present comments. Uh, my company, Palmer Logistics, is uh, we operate three million square feet with about three hundred and fifty employees. Ninety percent of what we do is in the port of is in the Houston area. Uh, we stock about three hundred million pounds of of goods, and we ship. Uh, well, we receive about 8,000 inbound shipments per month, and we ship out about 20,000 uh, outbound shipments per month. Uh, the majority of what we do is um, related to, to Houston. It's chemical industry, food, and then construction. Uh, we even do some work for the U.S. government, uh, some of the USAID cargo shipping out of, out of Houston. And so on any given month, we're processing somewhere around uh, 4,000 uh, plus or minus 15% TEUs um, through our facilities. Um, I'll just jump into the questions. Uh, I'll try not to be too uh, repetitive. Alex covered a lot of the, the comments that we had. Uh, key data elements. Um, the single most important piece of information is real-time schedule information uh, of the vessels so that we can plan and have our lab labor available to ship or receive the cargo from the warehouse. Um, the data, set, data sets that impact this would be the ship schedule and all changes there too. Um, the steamship line container availability, equipment availability, uh, the chassis availabilities, and then um, the dray driver availability within our market. Those were some of the areas that I thought were, were critical. Um, the data that you do not currently have access to that would improve your efficiency or performance. Um, we have access to most of the data we need. The biggest challenge to me is getting all that data integrated automatically kind of in one spot so we don't have to consult 
different portals, you know, pull information from the port of Houston, but then check chassis availability. If there was a way to kind of um, consolidate all that information to know, I think it would be really helpful. Um, one area I see great inefficiency is we really don't street turn a lot of equipment. Uh, and that's where you check a container out, uh, you know, maybe unload it uh, and, and then can reload it before it goes back to the port. I don't have the actual data in the port of Houston, um, but I'm going to guess it's somewhere around eight to 10%. You know, if we could just double, double that up to maybe 20% of street turns, it would make us so much more efficient. It would drastically cut down on trucks on the road, pollution, uh, port transactions, ins and outs at the gates of the port. Um, you know, so I think that would be really uh, an opportunity, uh, you know, for us to get more efficient and maybe handle more volume, uh, not necessarily with, with more people or more money, et cetera. It actually would be, would be better all around. Um, on the data transmission and access, um, we get, uh, as Alex said, we're, we're a third party logistics provider. Companies, um, you know, hire us to do the warehousing part for them. They provide us most of the information. Um, ideally, it comes through their enterprise resource planning system, like an SAP or an Oracle system. Uh, ideally, it's linked to us uh, and it kind of links all of their key players, the steamship lines, the, the freight forwarders, the customs clearance, the, the transportation partners. Um, all together and, and consolidates that information. Uh, we, we link with them via EDI or API uh, in most cases. Sometimes we actually still have to work directly in their system manually. Um, it's, that's less than ideal, but it is a way that we work with them. And then for the smaller customers, um, they, can tend, they can tend to be manual. So it's a lot less volume, but it's, it's not very efficient. It's emails back and forth manual communications, mostly via email, sometimes by, by, uh, by telephone, much smaller part of what we do, but it is, it is out there. Um, and then how do we provide data back to our customers uh, kind of in the same format that we shared. Uh, and then Alex also talked about KPIs. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's becoming very prevalent is, is data warehouses where you pull data from multiple systems. So we can pull it from our time management system, from our warehouse management system, et cetera, kind of put all the data together in one spot and then give our customer a portal um, to access that information. And uh, that would conclude my comments. Thank you, Commissioner Benzel. Thanks, Brad, that was really good. Um, Doug, um, Doug is, uh, is from uh, Canton, Ohio, um, sort of interior. Uh, so uh, uh, presume you, operating in the Northeast uh, primarily. Yeah, uh, Commissioner Mensel, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Yeah, we're headquartered here in Canton, Ohio, but we actually operate in seven states, including inland ports, or what we consider inland ports, Columbus, Cleveland, the Charlotte area, but also uh, direct port operations in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, and Jacksonville. And we're very similar to Brent, uh, to Brett, although a little bit larger. We've been around since 1914. We operate a little over 8 million square feet in 47 locations in the seven states we operate, which are Michigan, Ohio, West Virginia, Virginia, the Carolinas, and Florida. We also operate uh, transportation um, and some brokerage. Uh, we operate about 350 pieces of equipment, about 80 power units, about uh, 30 chassis. Um, so we actually do do some drayage and, uh, you know, very similar comments of uh, what uh, uh, Brett had mentioned, you know, a few data points that would be helpful is the available uh, empty chassis, um, as well as the wait time. You know, one of my managers suggested if they knew what the wait time was, they could coordinate with the carriers to avoid that congestion, those congestion times, or at least plan it into the turn. And he actually likened it to when you're in line at an amusement park, there's a sign that says you wait here from here is X number of minutes. Um, port capacity, you know, again, do they have the capacity to take back the empties or, or the fulls? Um, you know, we, we operate on behalf of our customers and that we never take title to the goods, but we're frequently the last one. We're the ones that put the seal on the container. And we're also the ones on the export and we're the ones that break the seal 
on the import. Um, so we're a key part in the whole, you know, security and, and so forth. Uh, a couple of managers that I talked to shared, you know, that, that who the customer is, the container number, the number of containers particularly expected at one time and, and when they're going to actually be uh, available. Because it's one thing for that they're in the port, but are they still on the ship? Have they been unloaded? What is the status? Are they actually ready for pickup? Um, you know, and obviously all the other information that goes along with it uh, around, you know, the commodity, the weight, the size, the pickup number, you know, if we're uh, the ones actually responsible for that. I, we understand the security there. Of, you may not want other parties other than those authorized uh, for that. But again, we do both export and import. So echoing uh, Brett's comments that, uh, you know, to the point that you could reuse some of that equipment rather than scheduling in a whole nother empty. Um, you could also keep that power unit turning because, you know, we want to see those things, uh, you know, the truck turning as well, because if that one truck can do multiple pulls or drops, then, you know, fewer trucks overall and, you know, can make the warehouse more efficient as well, particularly if we can load or unload that container um, and where the, the driver doesn't have to wait. Um, you know, the number of free days within that or, you know, are we in that allowance? So that way you can prioritize some of the uh, containers that may be getting closer to a demerge and just how and when that, you know, starts and stops so that, you know, we could triage some of the more critical path uh, containers that might be out there or getting close to the demerge for our, for our customers. Um, you know, one of the frustrations a little bit in that, you know, we're, one step of that process and the data that we see or input is only as good as the time or the integrity of that data, you know, kind of the old garbage in garbage out uh, rule. And a lot of times what we see is some of the big shippers actually put the onus on the warehouse or the carrier um, to do all the updates or do their work for them. Um, the railroads are famous for that from a standpoint of, you, you have to do all the work to find out where everything is rather than them pushing that information out there. You have to go find it. And heaven forbid, if you uh, in return don't update the information for them, then you know, a lot of times we see penalties or that's how you can be set up for some demerge charges that otherwise really aren't uh, the responsible uh, responsibility of the warehouse or the other part. Um, so we do appreciate you're reaching out because um, we think that we can be a key part of part of the solution here because a lot of uh, warehouse operators also do transportation. So they can have the perspective of both the carrier and the warehouse and, and you know, be the front line on behalf of our customers. And a lot of our customers are, you know, major, major Fortune 500. Uh, like Brett, we do a lot on the chemical side, uh, including Cabestro, which is the old bear chemical. Craton, which is formerly uh, Shell Chemical, Exxon, Dow, DuPont. Um, those are a lot of the customers that we at least do the export uh, part on the, on the chemicals and you know, particularly knowing that there's additional requirements uh, for that. So the scheduled sailings of when the cutoff times uh, are a couple of the other data points. So again, very similar comments to what you'll hear from Jared and what Brett has already mentioned. So I'm not going to rehash those other than ditto to what uh, Brett had done or said. But thank you and uh, again, appreciate the opportunity and for, for what it's worth and where we can help. Uh, Bob Gibbs is our uh, is my local congressman and I guess he's the ranking member on, on, uh, on the maritime side. So uh, tell them, tell them we're working, uh, we're working on solving some of the problems and you're uh, part of the solution. So uh, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I would would comment that I feel strongly that the distribution centers, the warehousing uh, facilities that are behind the ports are probably critical to being able to address uh, what is essentially a lack of capacity to our big ports. So if we don't uh, do a better job connecting um, our warehousing uh, and distribution centers uh, to the port operations, we're losing uh, valuable uh, uh, storage uh, and 
and uh, missing a chance to more efficiently move cargo through what is ex extremely uh, congested environment. So, um, but uh, with that, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move to, to Jared uh, Stadlin. Uh, Jared's from, uh, uh, I presume Linden is, uh, is that in the Philly region or is that uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the New York? Yeah, so, so thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Linden is uh, port proximate. So the port of New York, New Jersey lies in Newark and Elizabeth and uh, Linden is the next municipality over as you proceed south and, and is also waterfront. So uh, certainly proximate uh, uh, to the ports. So uh, I thank I thank you uh, for for getting this group together, uh, and I thank the panelists. And certainly, I'm going to layer on to what Alex, Brett, and and Doug had said. Um, Linden Warehouse and Distribution is a third party warehouse provider. So so like the others that have spoken so far, we provide warehousing as a service. We provide those services to Fortune 500 and global companies that that need a provider to provide service for them in the Northeast. And customers can be customers that have a single container, 20 or 40 foot container worth of inventory that they need to have loaded, unloaded, shipped uh, in the Northeast. And it could range up to customers with millions of pounds. So uh, we provide that outsource service uh, when, when customers need it. And um, in general, what you would have to think about is that our constraints uh, or our inputs are really space and labor, right? So to be able to do the job and, and create good throughput for, for material that is either going in, uh, going to be exported or coming in import, um, you've got to have space and you've got to have labor. And what's nice about this initiative that we're talking about today is by having better access to data, we could work smarter and address some of the concerns and bottlenecks that come up because of those two other constraints of space and labor. Um, Linden itself operates uh, over 1 million square feet of port proximate space we do provide similar services to what Brett and Doug have described. So a lot of our customers are manufacturers of chemicals, raw materials, material that goes into the manufacture of anything from food to cosmetics and so on uh, in, in the supply chain. So we definitely stay active. Uh, one of the things that you've been hearing with this supply chain um, crisis that you've heard about on the news and otherwise is that there's a perception that warehouses uh, get full or are full. And I wanted to address that because in general, warehouses do well and thrive when material moves. So we're, we look for distribution velocity. We look for speed. We operate well when a good amount of material comes in, but also goes out making room for the material that needs to come in. Similarly, if material doesn't go out rapidly because of, of Need, the availability of outbound ocean shipping container spots or outbound trucking, then you get the, the proverbial bottleneck. And having better access to data uh, will help us better plan for space and labor constraints. Now, sometimes people say, well, why is there a space constraint? Uh, you know, you should be able to go out, build, buy, or lease other warehouses. And what you have to understand is that port warehousing in this country that deals with materials that flow in and out through maritime is also just one part of it, the equation. This is also a lot of warehousing that is now used for e-commerce because all of our behavior has changed and we buy things online, expect them to ship. And so a lot of warehousing is also used for e-commerce. And many of those e-commerce warehouses are also dealing with these maritime uh, concerns. So let's talk specifically about key data uh, elements and data gaps. What are the key data elements that are integral to our operation? Well, the process starts for us Right now, we get notices, uh, whether it be via freight forwarders or our end customers who own the material that is becoming inbound, and I'll talk inbound import for a moment, and we get notification available to us several weeks out. So if material is leaving a port in Europe or leaving a port in, April, in, in, uh, in Asia, we have the ability to say, okay, this container is supposed to be on this vessel on this estimated ship date with this estimated arrival date, and ultimately, a lot of times we don't hear anything further until a trucker contacts us and says, hey, I've got limited free time to get all these containers off the port and they're inbound to your warehouse. And so what happens is the data we have becomes very reactive and it doesn't give us the opportunity to plan. Um, and if you think about our own behavior, when we go to airports, we can see the board, what's coming in, what's going out. When is our, when is our flight due to take off and are there any delays? 
And that type of real time or at least frequently updated data would better enable us to, to change. I mean, if I were flying to Cleveland and my inbound, I could even look on an app and find out that my inbound aircraft hasn't left Tampa. I now know, well, guess what? It's likely not to be on time and I can make inference and I can plan accordingly. And we don't have that kind of data, at least the warehouses, I can speak for my own operation, don't have that type of integrated visibility today. So what, what would be integral? I need to know when. When is a container due to arrive our facility? I, I need to know what, what is the, what is the container, the container number and, and what is on it. And what, what is on it matters because it could be a less than container load of five pallets and maybe getting that container empty will be quicker and I won't need as much labor. Or it could be a full floor loaded container, which would take more labor to unload. It could be 20 full pallets. So having information like that, as far as what's coming when, would it be integral to our operation? Hey, what Jared, just one, one, I'm sorry to cut in. How much of that information comes from shippers versus uh, carriers and, and terminals? Right. That you need? So all of the data is initially in the hands of the shipper because they're, they're manufacturing it abroad and it's and it's going to their freight border. They're booking with a with a with a steamship, and it's and it's coming. So that that information becomes initially available. Where we lose, at least at my end, visibility is once it hits whatever destination port abroad it's at, because we don't know did that container make that vessel? Is that vessel running on time, or is that vessel being diverted? I, and that is where, uh, at least from my end, as, as a warehouse operator, we lose. Uh, so. So information. So to answer your question, Commissioner, it's initially in the hands of the owner of the material as they make arrangements in their supply chain, uh, but then it goes into the hands of the steamship operator, and then we don't hear about that container, at least in my operation, until it hits hits near the port, and we understand when it's going to be available for pickup by a trucker. Okay. Um, what would what data do we not have access to that would improve our efficiency? Again. It's, it's not that we don't have access to a container number and an estimate. What we need is more, and, and, and some of your other speakers have touched upon it, we need real-time data. And that's the difference between allowing us to be proactive versus reactive. And it also, someone mentioned, I think it was Doug, uh, push or pull on that data. It would be nice if uh, there was an avenue where that information got pushed down to the ultimate destination so that we could have our own version of an airplane board to understand what was coming uh, down the line and we can plan accordingly. Um, move, moving on to some of the other questions that were asked is um, data transmission and access. How do we get data that we need from other support, uh, parts of the supply chain? You know, again, we all have access to things like EDI or customer ERP systems. We operate warehouse management systems to track inventory that's already here. Um, but, but right now, um, again, sometimes our first visibility to a container for this week is having a carrier call us up and say, we'd like five delivery slots to deliver five containers from this shipper on this date, maybe. So again, um, we're not getting a lot of that uh, electronically uh, on the inbound container side. On the outbound container side, of course, that's driven by our customers' ERB, ERP systems. They're like SAP. They're placing an order on us to ship material. Uh, they're, they're coordinating with their freight forwarder to get a booking on an outbound ship. And we have an estimated or desired ship day, um, and which all is great unless, unfortunately, there could be a booking that gets rolled or some other gate delay that would cause a container to leave at a later time. How do we provide data to our customers? We provide data by either interfacing with them in that ERP system, delivering information that we get from our WMS system back to them, uh, like Brett said, maybe manually sometimes, email or otherwise, um, or directly, like I said, in, the, in their system. Um, you know, just, just as I conclude my comments, I think that we have to understand that warehousing works best again when there's velocity and things and that if we can use this digital information to increase that velocity, it would be great. If we knew that an outbound shipment may be delayed because of congestion or, or a rolled booking earlier on you know, yard space, which is a premium 
having space available. We don't want to see containers stacked up in our yards. We want to see those containers going out on the date they're, they're supposed to. And if there's going to be a change, we'd like to know about it earlier. And on the inbound side, there's demerge considerations because carriers often react to the fact that containers are all of a sudden available at an influx of the port and they've run out of free time and they need to get those into the warehouse as soon as possible. And, if, and it tends to, again, be very reactive. So with that, I, I certainly uh, conclude my comments and, and would be happy to ask, answer questions later. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jared. Um, uh, again, all, all of you have done a great job uh, in providing a, a, some insight into to what you need. And, and it's similar, but it, it's good to, to, to get it uh, uh, from multiple sources. So uh, I don't have any problems with that. Jeremy Van uh, Puppelen uh, is uh, from uh, Danville. Uh, so I'm thinking that's uh, central uh, uh, California, Oakland uh, area, but, uh, but that's just my guess. And uh, I'd love to hear from you about uh, your, your perspectives. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, PRISM is a Northern California based uh, traditional 3PL. Uh, uh, we are right outside the port of Oakland and with one of our locations, we've got uh, seven locations throughout Northern California. Uh, so the one in Hayward, right outside of Oakland Port, and then we stretch out to Sacramento and through the Central Valley in Stockton. Uh, we've got about a million seven square feet, uh, 250 so employees, and really focused on food, beverage, and consumer packaged goods. Um, unlike some of these other guys out here in Northern California, we tend to stay away from a lot of the chemicals and those things that uh, take, take a lot of uh, oversight and control from a regulatory standpoint. So. Uh, we stay away from those as much as we can, but really focus in on the food and consumer packaged goods. Um, I, you know, it's easy to go last. It's kind of like a, an echo and ditto here with <laughs> everything these guys have said. Uh, they're, they're great companies, know them all well, do a great job, and they've covered the majority of it. Um, so I think, you know, just kind of touching base on the key data elements, we just need to be able to regurgitate back to our customers what they want to see. There are a couple of necessities for us on our side of the business. We need to know when it's coming, what's on the container, how it's getting here, you know, the wins, the where's the whys. Uh, but then I want to be able to give back to my customer what is it they want to see. You know, is it uh, item information, lot information, whatever might be applicable to that container for them, uh, whatever elements they want to see. Because all we're doing is taking information aggregating that for different clients and then putting it back to them. So for us, um, the base, yeah, when and where, how are we getting it, what's on it, we need to know those things so that we can put it in the system and hopefully give that visibility to our clients ahead of time. Um, but we really just pass back on information for what our clients are asking us to show them. Um, I think we have, like everybody else, pretty much have access to all the information we want. Uh, unfortunately, like they've all said, it's really more of a pull. It's, uh, it seems like it's begging for information sometimes more than them being able to push it to us. Uh, so just having something that's more visible across the board where we can uh, log on, see those things, and then be able to pull that information directly into our system, aggregate that data, and then uh, take a look at it with our clients, that'd be helpful. Um, situationally for us right now, Port of Oakland, uh, we've got two clients and I uh, won't go into any names, but uh, they're begging us to hold empty space. So we've allocated so much space for them. They have a typical carry of say 3,000, 4,000 pallets. Uh, they can't get their containers in right now. And so we're sitting on empty space and we're saying, hey, your inventory is down 80%. You know, and as Jared was saying, we make money on space and labor. So I've, I'm carrying this open space that I'd really like to be able to turn containers through uh, but they don't know when they're going to get them. Yeah, I've got 90 containers coming into you. Well, when are they going to get here? We don't know. Uh, so I'm carrying all this open space, essentially losing money. And they're asking me to hold it for them. And they've been a good client for so many years that I want to make sure I hold that space for them uh, so that we get into that situation where some people might not hold that. They might sell that space. And then you've got a, an old client that ends up getting backed up even further at the port because the warehouses are trying to best utilize their space to be profitable. Um, you know, it's it's, it's a tough situation. If we know when those things are coming in, we can try and uh, mitigate it some, hold and sell the space we have. Uh, but then the labor side, uh, as the guys have said, it's, it's tough to get labor right now. It's uh, across the board, I think, any industry. Uh, we're all fighting for the same pool of folks right now, just trying to get people in. 
being able to plan that labor out two weeks, three weeks, a month in advance versus two, three days, uh, that's a significant uh, head start if you got a few weeks. So uh, I think same issues as the other guys, still working through it. Um, we're EDI as well, so a lot of what we get, it's still going to be electronic, uh, just an integration with SAP, Oracle, Mass, different systems that our customers are utilizing. Uh, and then when we're providing data back to them, we run an API poll that uh, just kind of transfers everything to a web portal for our clients to see. Um, again, going back to regurgitating information, if they can send us that information in advance that says, here, I've got this container, uh, it's supposed to be on this vessel coming in, we can book that PO through the API calls that shows them that that container is due in at a specific date and time. Now, that changes consistently, uh, as we all have said, but uh, we can at least give them the visibility into their own inventory needs and what's coming in based on what they can provide us. Um, so just the API calls, EDI, same kind of stuff the other guys running with. Um, and I think that's about it for now. I don't think there's much the other folks haven't covered, but uh, I think I'm good with, with going there for now. So thank you. Hey, Jeremy, let me ask you a question about, uh, I, since you do uh, food products, I presume you do a lot of export. Uh, uh, versus uh, import, uh, and uh, what is the situation with ERDs uh, in Oakland, and whether or not are you getting uh, sufficient information uh, to allow you to get, if it's a, a, a refrigerated uh, product that has a limited uh, a shelf life I, or transportation shelf life, and how are things going with the information that you're getting about uh, uh, vessel movements for pickup on export uh, cargoes? Yes, yeah, so we actually, uh, oddly enough, we don't do a lot of export. Okay. On food. And what the okay. export that we do, it's uh, it's dry goods. So we have a fair amount uh, of dry goods that we'll load out. And it's um, it, the information is coming to us directly from our customers. So our customers are doing pretty good about getting us the information. And then we're not typically going to be lining up the drainage for them, getting things back to the port or handling the forwarding. Uh, so in our link, it, it runs pretty well because we've got a really good connection with our customers when it comes to orders coming to us and things that need to go out. Uh, it's the, the other part of the process on the inbound side where they don't know, so they can't tell us where that struggle is. But um, as far as the communication with our clients on what needs to go out, when it needs to go out, being able to uh, work with trade companies to get it to the port on time. Um, our link is pretty secure there with the way it's going with the customers and uh, that speed of information is pretty good. Okay, uh, so I have a question for, well, thank you uh, all. That was really uh, good uh, uh, comments. I appreciate it. It was uh, uh, helpful and, and uh, I think it's all moving in the same direction. So uh, it makes it a little bit easier if, if we're looking at, uh, at uh, what should be included in the national da uh, data standard. So uh, it's, it, uh, it helps us. Um, one of the questions I had is, uh, um, provided that we're able to uh, come up uh, with some sort of uh, common operating picture, uh, which everybody seems to need uh, at each port, uh, uh, do you think that uh, I'm, not every distribution center or warehouse needs to be part of it, uh, but, but uh, I do think, uh, this is my view, uh, that um, that there needs to be some uh, transparency with the re with respect to the warehouses themselves, uh, the distribution centers in terms of operations and whether or not they have uh, potentially uh, assets, trucking assets or services that they could provide. Uh, so what, what, and I'll start off with uh, Alexander, do you think uh, this is something that your company could provide uh, in a, a public fashion if it was a, a big enough entity to justify uh, the sort of information? Yeah, of course, by all means, and then um, <clears throat> we're definitely open to uh, 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 being a, a part of this, as everyone else has said. I mean, and of course, transparency is key, right? Because uh, with, with even if that knowledge might not contribute in a way, it might help in, in other ways, but uh, transparency, I think, is key, and, and we're willing to to open up that book, if you will, and, and help out in any way, shape, or form. Uh, Brett? Yeah, just to clarify, this is, you know, basically capacity, space and labor of what we could, what we could, uh, you know, basically surge handle. Uh, is that what you're speaking about? Yeah, yeah, basically what your operational 
uh, hours are and, and where you are with with the being able to take in new cargo and and those the issues that you you described. Yeah, I, I would be happy to share that information, uh, kind of post it out there for the public to see. Um, you know, it, it could actually help us drive business. So I, I have no issues with that. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it, someone mentioned the airport uh, uh, schedules and, and you go to an airport and uh, there's a lot of facilities right outside the airport and you sort of know how they operate and, you know, how many parking spaces there are in parking garages and where to go for for uh, shuttle services and, and, and things like that. So that's the, the thought is if we can organize that better. Uh, Doug, uh, what about you? Yeah, it, it kind of depends on the facility because some of, we really have two components to our, our business. Some is, is what we would call the, the, the public side of, of warehousing. Right. And that's where we are open to receive other clients and customers. But we also have a contractual or what we call the private side where I may have, for example, my facility in Monk's Corner or Charleston, South Carolina is dedicated to one customer. And so there really isn't any excess capacity related to that because it, it's dedicated. Um, but to the point where, you know, my capacity or the other, I guess the only caution is that, you know, we see this within our own trade association where we publish our facilities and services. And a lot of times, you know, I may have space this month, but two months later, I don't. Right. Or, or vice right. versa. So, you know, where people were over promise and under deliver. And I think what you're really looking for is some solutions, but particularly where, you know, I understand where you're maybe going. It's like, hey, if you have a situation in a port, maybe there's a network that you could reach out to that who has capacity. And then right. they could respond to that. Because one of our frustrations that we're seeing right now is, and whether it's, you know, the, the dray carriers can't get chassis or our shippers can't get empty containers is that, you know, they send us orders knowing that, you know, there's a ship to sail and th these number of shipments are going to go out. We start to pull those orders, we stage them, and then they can't get the inbound container or the power underneath it. And then it's sitting on my dock. And then at a certain point, I either need to charge them to put that back away or otherwise I get choked on that activity. And, you know, cause I don't have room to put, to stage the other, the same thing that, you know, the ports are seeing where, you know, whether it's too many empties or too much volume inbound. And I think we also may need to give some thought that, you know, one of the things that we're seeing is these ships get larger, you know, the port facilities are still catching up to the larger size of these ships. And that surge push or, you know, import or export um, is going to have to be planned for, for and dealt with that, you know, you know, some of my facilities where we do do rail, for example, you know, I may only have five car spots. Well, if the railroad ships me 10, I can only handle five at a time. Right. So I think we may need to put some thought into how that, you know, later plays out that I'm sure there's short term issues medium term issues and obviously those kind of infrastructure may be a little bit longer term. Yeah, well I th I think that's a, a good response. It's a, it's not necessarily ne necessary in all cases, but but it, I do agree with you that that uh, there are circumstances where there's capacity that's not being utilized that could more efficiently uh, be utilized to to expedite movement through the ports and and these warehouses Distribution centers, uh, free PLs can function as an auxiliary uh, uh, to, to port operations and, and marine terminal operations, and so, um, uh, so yeah. But but it but it's not necessary if it's not if you're not functioning as a common carriage uh, service that's open uh, uh, to to traffic. So, uh, Jared. Thank you. I, yeah, I, I echo a lot of the, the comments that already have been made. Certainly, we're willing to put out there when we've got availability. Um, and we are a multi-client. Our facilities are multi-client facilities. Uh, you know, while we have some dedicated and reserved space, uh, you know, in a multi-client facility, it's it's certainly um, expected and appreciated when when folks reach out to you to see if you can handle their business. So uh, no problem sharing information on a uh, on availability and capacity. Uh, I think Doug's point uh, a moment ago was a good one about the larger capacity ships, right? Uh, our country has made a, an investment in, in, uh, in dredging and raising bridges uh, to accommodate 
uh, vessels that have larger TEU capacity per vessel. But what that does is if I had a customer historically that would bring in 50 containers in a three week period, they might be divided on multiple vessels over that three week period. If they're able to get capacity and it all gets loaded on one ship, those 50 containers arrive on a Monday with limited free time and they all need to get in. So you, we've got a, a funnel effect sometimes based on uh, just the larger capacity ships coming between different routes. So if, if data uh, or capacity uh, information can be aligned better uh, through this initiative or otherwise, I think maybe that's a, a way to at least try to plan for those type of scenarios. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're certainly for uh, and supportive of, of, of anything that can better match capacity with, with demand. I completely agree with your comments on the uh, the stress that these large vessels put on the system uh, in terms of management. Uh, you know, you're coming in with uh, 24,000 TU uh, uh, container ships on the West Coast. I, I I did the math, and you would be moving cargo containers out, and they would have reached Las Vegas before the last one was uh, was uh, unloaded in a, in a vessel of that uh, magnitude. So that's a lot of cargo uh, that you have to handle and it, it does put stress on the system. So if we don't do a better job of trying to anticipate this and having some overflow space uh, working with your industry, uh, I, I think we're, we're gonna be in problems in the, in the future. Um, Jeremy, any, any thoughts, comments? Um, similar, yeah, I think we're always wanting to fill our capacity. That's uh, the goal of any 3PL is to fill your space and turn it. and. Uh, keep it going. Um, you know, I think our goal is definitely to fill it with the uh, the right customer base. It'd be really tough to fill up a multi-user building with a bunch of one-month clients where uh, you get them through the hurt and then they're all gone in a month and then you're trying to figure out how to uh, fill that space again. So definitely have to post information with uh, regards to capacity and what we can do to help. But uh, end goal, we're looking for relationships, partnerships that are going to be longer term, not forcing us back into selling that space shortly down the road. Uh, my next uh, question has to do with uh, trucking and that, you know, we're having a lot of challenges with both with uh, drage trucking um, and, and intermodal chassis and the availability of chassis. And that's a really uh, uh, a major challenge. And, and I think each of your companies has some uh, I, I, I think it was Doug, you mentioned that you did some of your own drayage and had some of your own chassis. And, uh, but it, it seems to me that we need, really need to do a better job of managing uh, these common assets uh, that are used uh, as, as intermodal chassis and, uh, and, and finding you know, drivers, regular drivers, who's really providing continual service. How do you do dispatch for trucking. And in some cases, your client's going to do it for you and, and it's not a problem. But uh, if you do do dispatch uh, uh, with respect to trucking and, and secure uh, chassis, how is that done uh, right now? And, and what, what, what challenges are there in this area? Start off uh, just in the same order, Alex, Brett, Doug, uh, Jared, and Jeremy, to the extent you want to answer it. So. Yeah, so so yeah, we do a lot of that as well. We we, we outsource all of that, uh, whether it be local drainage or intermodal transportation. So uh, yes, everyone is facing with uh, a driver shortage, whether it be a chassis shortage or equipment shortage. Any of the three, uh, what we have done is basically <laughs> cast our net as wide as possible to all the companies, brokers, whether it be with brokers, whether it be with uh, contracts with direct uh, common carriers. Uh, and cast that net as wide as possible and see who has the capacity, uh, the capacity to be able to handle it. Uh, also, you know, kind of share the load, you know, you know, what's happened a lot is that a lot of our, our go-to uh, partners will say, listen, I just don't have the capacity and then I'll see who else can, can handle that move, whether it's share it or, or divide it amongst our, our top three or four brokers or partners that we have uh, working with. Uh, but it is definitely a challenge and there, I hope there is a, a way where we can uh, analyze that and, and, and adapt to that uh, because you know there is a severe shortage when it comes to drivers. Yeah, uh, so it's sort of ad hoc now. You just basically deal with it and see yeah. if you can find people who are available. Exactly, that's exactly right. Brett? Yeah, I just was going to add, we, we, we run a, a Dre company as well. 
Um, and our biggest, to me, the biggest challenge is the lack of chassis equipment, because what happens is uh, the drivers have to go and they have to wait at the chassis pour. They just can't get equipment. And so they say, listen, I'd rather just do a local truckload move and not work in the port. So a lot of our, our owner operator drivers are saying, look, we'll keep driving for you, but we don't want to do port work anymore. And so, you know, what we're doing is we're putting port congestion fees and we're trying to tag, you know, we're ending up passing more cost to the end customer just to try to incentivize these drivers to keep going to the port. There's certainly a shortage of drivers, but I, to me personally, at least in, in Houston with our team, the, the equipment um, shortage is even worse. And so we've tried to buy new chassis, but, uh, you know, it's a 20 week lead time to get them. So we've committed to buy more equipment. It's just a matter of, you know, when it'll deliver and we can get that equipment into the pool and, and, and working, you know, cause I think what happened is it started on the West coast. So they started repositioning chassis from ports around the U S and then as, as freight started spreading from the West coast, higher volumes to say Houston, then we got it. Then we had a shortage. So it kind of, it kind of spread. And so, you know, we're trying to give a monetary incentive to drivers to continue doing port drayage, and we're trying to buy more equipment. Okay, but but your real your bigger challenge is just the equipment itself. Uh, uh, any evidence that uh, that shippers are uh, keeping their cargo on wheels uh, longer, and that it's making putting additional stress on on uh, on the the equipment? Yeah, I think we are. We're seeing a lot higher per diem what what will happen is we'll check a container out for for a shipment and then the booking a roll and then the steamship line will charge per diem and it's like well wait a minute you rolled the booking you allowed us to right take, you allowed us to take the uh the equipment out um you know but some of the some of the um steamship lines are just assessing per diem okay. and so we're kind of seeing unprecedented per diem and i think that's a that's a big driver there's that 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 contributes to the problem for sure is it on both sides is it uh is it shippers keeping uh, cargo on, on wheels longer or is it more on the steamship side? Um, I personally, I, I'd like to have the panels as, as assessment, but I think it's more on the steamship line with, with the rolled bookings more than anything. Okay. Because, because the, my customers, they don't want to tie up their inventory in a container. I mean, that's working capital to them and they're trying to turn these goods as quick as possible because you know, as they have that sitting in a container, they're not, they're not, their money's not working for them. It's, it's tied up in inventory. So I, I think it's more of a steamship line. Problem. Okay. Uh, anybody else want to, to, uh, we're getting to the end. I want to give Kristen a chance to, uh, uh, to ask any questions, but uh, anyone else want to comment on the trucking situation and in terms of availability of, of equipment and, and, and drivers as well, you know, who's, actively driving in the markets uh, that you need? Yeah, real quick, I would echo, you know, on Brett's side that I think it is more on the, our experience on the steamship line that, you know, the rolled bookings, canceled bookings, um, and there's kind of a ripple effect, whether it be from that, and then the, the carriers getting the chassis, the empty containers for the outbound. And we all know that, you know, there's an imbalance of where, where the containers are versus where the shipments are. And until that seems to filter through, um, you know, our backlog of orders, both on the inbound and the outbound, uh, have been a challenge. And then, you know, we're willing to invest in some more equipment, but it reaches a point where the law of diminishing returns and that, and because of that lead time, and then we all know the dilemma that, you know, we don't do as much retail as some of the other folks, um, but that retail push from, you know, July through November obviously puts a strain that, you know, gets alleviated somewhat in the first half of the year, but, um, and now, you know, this past year when, you know, China was shipping back empty containers so that they could get more outbound, you know, took all that capacity out of the system. And that's where we saw a lot of it. So to us, it is more on the, on the ship lines um, than it is on the, on the shippers themselves. Okay. Uh... So, uh, Kristen, did you have any uh, uh, questions that you wanted to, to pose? Sure, if we could do a quick speed round. Um, I think there's this general theme, especially on the, what I'll call the 
what, where, and when of the cargo, particularly on the inbound side and the lack of that visibility and real-time information generally. Do you have any examples, and you don't have to name names, but just examples of particular um, either terminals or VOs who actually do a good job of proactively providing that information in a usable format? We could do same order, starting with Alex and running through. Yeah, I think I'm trying to think of <laughs> any example here that, that does a good job. I mean, like, like everyone said, we, we all have to kind of forget that information, right? So um, whether it be through the terminal website or the carrier, or if we handle the forwarding, we could try to get that information. I, I fortunately don't have any examples that I can refer to at this moment <laughs> that, you know, that I can that's say, well, sad. these guys are really doing a good job, man. You know, they're pushing the information through us, but that's simply not the case today. <laughs> Yeah, I'll go next uh, real quick. Um, you know, we're, our primary experience is Port of Houston. Um, we actually feel like they do a pretty good job. Uh, we're tied into their system. We run a Dre uh, computer software program, you know, our warehouse management called VI, VI CompCare, and we're directly linked into the port. So as they update their system on, on, uh, on equipment availability, you know, container availability, we get real time, pretty much real time updates in our system. Uh, we can also, you can also set it up to get an alert as well. And so I, I think Port of Houston does a really nice job. I heard that. Yeah, we work quite a bit with Norfolk and Jacksonville and uh, Savannah and Charleston. And from what I understand, our, you know, they work with the ports pretty well, but the ports are somewhat subject to the information they get from the shipping lines. And so, you know, it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg on who has what. But as far as the actual operations with the port, I think, you know, everyone's obviously trying is that there are some log jams, which, you know, appreciate your efforts in trying to, you know, unjam some of that. So thanks for your time. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is that um, I think there's visibility once a container arrives and when it's available for, for pickup. And I think the carriers have access to that and that enables them to in turn schedule uh, delivery appointments uh, with us. Um, again, uh, as I mentioned in my comments earlier, I think the interesting piece that would be missing is once it would be nice to know if, if something's on the water for three weeks or two weeks and there's a delay or a change in routing or something that will create a expectation that the container might arrive much later, it would be good to see if that information was available earlier when you're trying to plan uh, an influx of containers. So uh, I think it, I think there's visibility for what's here now and when it's ready. Um, I, it would be interesting to see if, if that visibility can increase or, or move a little bit further out. Uh, yeah, in agreement, I think that final mile part is is doing well, good visibility there once it's there. I'm not running any trucks into the port. We, uh, we broker that out and the relationship with the brokers, very visible from the point of entry at port and knowing it's ready to get to us. Uh, prior to that, again, I, I'm not seeing anything that I would say uh, kudos to anybody at this point. Anything else, Kristen? Nope, that does it for me. Thanks. Okay. Well, I really appreciate uh, the effort that you put into this. Uh, it's critical. Um, I, I'm, uh, I, I feel strongly that uh, uh, warehouse... Uh, uh, distribution centers, 3PLs are, are, are very important in how our port system operates and need to be connected uh, to a greater extent rather than, uh, than what we have right now, uh, frankly. Um, and, uh, and so we're going to look uh, to see if there's a way to, to, uh, to generate some uh, standards in this area, commonalities, common operating picture. Um, uh, it's just, uh, it's too big. Uh, uh, the, the comment that was made about uh, airports is, is true here. Uh, you know, you can go into an airport, you know how to get through the system. Uh, you know how many parking spaces are available in the parking garages. You've got long, short term and, and, and medium term parking. You have places to book your car, to book your luggage inside and outside. You've got a security system that's set up. And you know where you're, when you're going to go up and you know when you're going to get down. Uh, and uh, and we just don't have that here. It's a lot of speculation. <laughs> um, and so that creates problems. And we have probably more congestion in our seaports now than we do in our airports. Uh, 
uh, just because of the volumes of cargo. But uh, we may be back in contact. We're going to review uh, uh, the, the uh, session and uh, might uh, follow up. Uh, but I really appreciate, again, your uh, participation in this. If you want to submit anything else, um, uh, after the meeting, just put it on the on the on the uh, email address that I said. Uh, and if your association uh, wants to uh, uh, to put any comments in uh, of a generic uh, nature or, or or in response to the specific comments that have been made, please do that. Um, but uh, uh, we'll be back in touch uh, as we move through the process. And appreciate again your uh, your willingness to help. Thank you so much, Commissioner Benzel. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Thank you for okay. having us. Have a good day. We'll Thank call you, everyone. Thank you. Yep. See ya. Bye.